Welcome to Finance and Excel video number 73. Hey, if you want to download this workbook for chapter 8 or the PowerPoints for chapter 8, click on the link directly below the video and scroll way down to the Finance Excel section. In this video, we got to talk about the IRR, the internal rate of return. But before we do that, let's just remind ourselves. We did net present value and we built a net present value profile. What does this chart show us? Here's our inter, uh, our required rate of return. This is our discount rate. This is the one inside the firm. They decide what their required rate of return is. This is saying includes all the risks they might uh, associate with the project. Then they say, OK, we require this return, or we're not going to accept uh, anything less than this return, or we're not going to accept the project. So what do we do? When we calculate net present value, we plotted net present value given the cash flows right, at all sorts of different rates. We can see um, whatever that rate is right there, anything less than that, that means our required return, we get a positive net present value. Anything greater than this, we're going to get a a negative net present value. And so th this net present value profile can easily tell us what that intersecting rate is. That's called the internal rate of return. It just means that is the hurdle, right? Anything, so if this is 16%, right? Anytime we have a uh, required rate of return less than 16%, we are definitely going to accept this project. Anything greater, so if it's the internal rate of return is 16, and we said, no, 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 no. We, our required return should be 19%, uh, then we're not going to accept the project. All right, uh, this shouldn't come as a surprise to us, because we've already solved for rate. Back in chapter 5, with annuities and multiple cash flows, we knew some cash flows for a particular loan, and we calculated the actual rate using the rate function. Same with bonds, right? We use the rate function. We, well, we knew the cash flows for a bond, and we determined yield to market, right? So here we are in chapter 8. We have multiple cash flows for buying assets. So just as the yield to market, yield to market was internal rate of cash flows for bonds, the IRR will be the internal rate of cash flows for capital budgeting. And they have a, a specific function called IRR. We don't have to use rate. And it is the easiest amongst all of the financial functions to use. IRR is, is also incredibly common and popular as an um, investment criteria. Um, so let's go look at this chart right here. Again, sometimes a picture tells a thousand words. Let's just think about this. Here's all these positive net present values. Here's all these negatives. Well, what about exactly when it crosses the line? What is net present value? It's 0. So that's the definition of the internal rate of return. It's a rate at which net present value is equal to 0. And uh, if you were to set up uh, the big long math formula, you would set up your discounted cash flow formula and then just set it equal to 0 and solve for rate. Luckily, we don't have to do that. We can use the IRR function. But again, what is the concept here? If you just get that it is the hurdle, dividing line between positive net present value, uh, negative net present value, accepting the project, not accepting or rejecting the project. That is what internal rate of return is going to mean for us. All right, here's our rule. Obviously, if the IRR is greater than our required return, this is the one that's um, in internal to the cash flows, meaning we will cal calculate this rate from the cash flows. This is the one that's decided in advance inside the business, right? And we can see this picture over here, right? Here's IRR. Anything, is it? Is this greater than all of these? Yes, and so that's what the rule means. Anytime IRR is greater than our internal required, sorry, I shouldn't use the word internal, the inside the business, their required rate of return, then we accept the project. This is the most important alternative to net present value. And it is the easiest to calculate if you're using Excel, because the formula inputs will be the cash flows only. 
it's very popular out in the working world also. There are two problems with it, which we'll see. But besides those two problems, uh, the internal rate of return, or the IRR function, and the net present value function will give you the same decision. Also, the reason why it's so popular is because it's a percentage rate, and people like to talk in terms of rates. Now, here's the IRR function. There's a couple important things. There's two arguments. The values means you just type the cash flows into the cells and then highlight them. The guess, that's you don't usually need to put a guess if it's having a hard time calculating because this is an iterating function, meaning it goes back and forth and back and forth and zeroes in on the answer. Sometimes you have to give it a guess. Uh, so the values, these are going to be the range of the cells with the cash flows. Cash out is negative, as we've done all through this class. Cash in is positive. Range of values must contain at least one positive and one negative. A guess is not required. If you get a num arrow, then you might want to try a guess. Cash flows must happen at the end of each period. And look at this. The programmers actually paid attention when they did this function, IRR, whereas when they did net present value, they didn't pay much attention. Cash flow starts at time 0. right? So all you've got to do is put 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the cash flows, and boom, it'll calculate the internal rate of return. Cash flows do not have to be equal in amount. Again, totally awesome. But the time between each cash flow must be the same. Uh, IRR will give you the period rate as always. All right, our example, we're going to use the same example. This is the fourth uh, investment decision criteria we're looking at. We're looking at IRR here. Let's go over to Excel. Same cash flows we've had all through uh, this chapter. It's going to cost $160,000. And then these are our three cash flows. Our required rate of turn is 12, right? So IRR, you're not going to believe this, equals IRR. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. So all of them. That's it. And it tells us 16%. i got to increase the uh, column width here. So it's very simple. If the internal rate of return is 16, and we only uh, have a, a required rate of return of 12%, then we definitely take the project, right? We want 12, and it's going to give us 16. Because remember, this is the internal rate. That means from those cash flows, what is the return going to be? Again, just think back to when we did bonds and uh, annuities in Chapter 5. We were able to determine the rate. So if the required return is less than or equal to 16, actually, they say just less than. The way it works is if you happen to get uh, a required rate of return exactly equal to the internal rate of return, maybe you're supposed to be indifferent. But you know, if this is the return you want and you're exactly at this, then why not take it? So if the required return is less than or equal to 16.49, and you can see if I increase the decimals there, you can see that's the actual uh, number with all the decimals showing. Actually, there's probably a few more, too, in there. But any time our required return is less than this rate here, then we accept. Otherwise, we reject the project. So because 12% is less than the 16.5, we accept the project. And when the required return is 16.5 or whatever this is right here, net present value will be exactly equal to 0. Now, we're going to build a, uh, a chart for this one, just like we did with the net present value. Let's go ahead and do this here. We're going to calculate net present value, and then we're going to chart. Because remember, this net present value profile, the, when that crosses the x-axis, that is the internal rate of return, or the crossover rate. All right, so you ready? Equals net present value. And our rate, I'm going to go one cell to the left, comma, the values these ones right here, and I'm going to hit the F4 key to lock it, close parentheses, plus, and then that uh, railroad track, or pound sign, right there, and I'm going to hit the F4 key. All right, and I'm going to double click and send this down. 
Let's go to the bottom and make sure we got it right. Looks, so it's got that, and those are still locked, looking good. I'm going to click Escape. All right, now we want to do that chart just like we did before. We want a different uh, color for when it's negative. So I'm going to go steal this function, copy without the equal sign. And what's true about this column? Well, actually, let's make the chart and then look at it. And then we'll come back and do that formula and add the uh, the formula here and then add that data to the chart. So insert area and then right here. Right, so at this point right here it's all negative and so we need to add a second data series. Actually let me, uh, I'm going to click there and delete. We'll add all that stuff back later. I'm going to point to the edge here and hold shift and make the chart a little bit smaller. Point to the edge and pull it down here. Okay, so now anytime net present value is negative, we want some values in this column, otherwise we don't. So I'm going to come here, I'm going to type equals if, and our logical test is going to be, and I'm going to control V, I copied that from over there. Anytime that is less than zero, and just out of curiosity, the, we did this chart one time before, and we were way down here. What do you think it's going to be right now? Is it going to be true or false? This is a logical test. If I hit the F9 key, false, right? Because that 60,000 is not less than control, less than zero. Control Z, comma. And you know what? Uh, the last video we. Um, we did the formula this way. I just uh, there's another way to do this. Let's just say if that one cell to my left is less than zero, which is the net present value, comma what do we want? We want one cell to my left. Otherwise, we want double quote, which is the in Excel uh, formula language that means blank. So I'm going to close parentheses, Control Enter, double click and send it down. Okay, so now we can see right here, it's going to give us all the, those values. Now we can click on the chart and we're going to add that data series up to the chart tools, design, select data. Okay, now we need to do a lot of things here. We need to fix this up just like we did last time. Those are the wrong uh, items. So I'm going to click right there and remove because we don't need that series. This one right here. That's the net present value. That's the one we want, but we want to edit this. And I'm going to highlight these percentages. I'm going to click there and then Control Shift Down Arrow. And then I'm going to click OK. Oh, now I can. Oh, let me. I'm going to have to click OK and scroll up. I'm going to click there and delete. Click on the chart and go back up here because we, we need to add this data series here. Add. The series name is the minus net present value. I'm going to highlight that and delete. It's very important to delete that because it'll get in the way if you don't. Uh, and then highlight just the numbers all the way down. Control Shift Down Arrow. Then click OK. Edit. Control Shift Down Arrow. Click OK. Click OK. Okay, and now they're all the. Actually, that doesn't look very good. Let's go up here to layout, and up here I want to select the uh, minus net present value. Oh, okay. So we have a problem here. Uh, we, we need to. Actually, we could probably edit it right here. You can see it's highlighted right there. You can either go back up to the design and then select data, or you can click and drag this down. If you can notice that somehow I didn't have the right range there, and now it's there. If you go back up to design, and then here, the other way to have done it was to edit it, right? And so now you can see it got the right label there, and now it's looking from 13 to 44, so that's correct. Click OK, click OK. Uh, and then I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Click on this axis, Control-1, because we want to go to number. Maybe show decimal point place is 0. Click Close. OK, that's looking OK. We need to add some uh, labels for our 
horizontal axis and vertical. So I'm going to go to Layout, Chart, uh, Axis, Titles, Horizontal, Below. I'm going to type R, 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 open parentheses, Discount Rate. Now how come this label here when I hit Enter, why, why isn't that IRR? Because this is, these are all of our required rates of return. It's just the single point at which this crosses the axis where net present value is zero. That's the IRR. All right, and then we need an act, uh, label over here. So I'm going to go to Title, Vertical. I'm going to type net present value, Enter. All right, I'm going to drag this in a little bit. All right, so it's just an Important when we're, uh, you know, visually it helps us to understand exactly what this means. Net present value equals to zero. It's the uh, hurdle rate. Uh, let's do look at one more thing over in the PowerPoints. So we want to ask uh, about our decision criteria, IRR. Does the IRR rule account for the time value of money? Yes, it does. Does the IRR rule account for the risk of the cash flows? Yes, it's um, it's compare. We're comparing this rate to the required rate of return, which has the risk. Does the IRR rule provide an indication about the increase in value? It does, right? Because we can compare it um, to our expected uh, increase in value, which in our example was um, twelve percent, right? So yeah, we're going to be getting more. Right? So it expresses the increase in value as a percentage, not as a dollar amount. The net present value expressed it as a dollar amount. The IRR expresses it as a percent. Should we consider IRR rule as our primary decision criteria? Well, no, because of two circumstances, which we'll see in the next video. But um, in fact, let's just jump to slide 50. There it is. NPV and IRR will generally give us the same uh, decision if we have conventional cash flows. And we'll, we have a whole video on this one coming up. But cash flows at time zero is negative, and the remaining cash flows are positive. Anytime that's the situation, it's OK to use either one of these, IRR or NPV. Both give the same answer. And project. Uh, projects are in independent. And this only comes into play when you have uh, more than one project or investment you're considering, right? And we'll talk about that uh, in a video coming up. But when both of these are true, which means the projects are independent, who cares if you, if you accept this one project? So the decision to accept or reject this project does not affect the decision to accept or reject any other project. If that's true and the cash flows are conventional, you can use either one. All right, and those are the two circumstances. And we'll see the problem when you have non-conventional cash flows and we have mutually exclusive projects. But otherwise, this rule works great. Advantages of IRR, knowing a return is intuitively appealing. And in fact, that well, that's why throughout history it's been the most popular, right? Because people like to talk in terms of percentages. It is a simple way to communicate the value of the project to someone who doesn't know all the estimation details, right? You just have that percentage. That is the beauty and the advantage of percentages oftentimes. If the IRR is high enough, right, when you calculate it, it's very high. You may not need to estimate a required return, which is often a difficult task. In the working world, many people use IRR. So let's summarize. We haven't gotten to the profitability index yet. That's in a video, a couple videos ahead. But so far, we've done present value, and we accepted the project. Payback period, reject. Average accounting return, reject. And internal rate of return, we accept it. All right, in our uh, next video, we'll talk about the IRR again for non-conventional cash flow and mutually exclusive projects. All right, see you next video.